Okay, should we begin? All right, why don't we begin? Um, so why don't we begin? Uh, Karen and Carol, uh, and I think Pete belong to a dance group, so they want to start now. So why don't we begin in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Almighty God, inflame us with your love so that we may take our place in the cross of Christ and grow closer to you and become deeper part of your church. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. So this is part two. And before I start, somebody mentioned something to me. Uh, and this is on an unrelated note. They, this crazy woman came up to me. And I, I'm not going to name names. And um, she... <laughs> not her, not an Italian, um, but she had a good point where she says, oh, I disagree with your homily this weekend. Okay, so why is that? And she says, well, you, uh, uh, it was on uh, the second scrutiny, which is social sin. She says, she said, you can't, just because there's problems in the Catholic Church, you can't leave the Catholic Church. Um, what's wrong? Oh, okay. Um, anyhow, and she said, you know, you implied that the couple should leave the country club. And I said, no, no, I never said that they should leave the country club. I said, you know, I, I think they should have stayed part of the country club. But once your eyes are open to see the sin, you have to be part of the solution. I'm not leaving the Catholic Church. I'm not leaving the United States because... I'm, does that make any sense? And her husband, who's a saint, tried to correct her. But... Um, <laughs> But he's been working with her for years. So, um, but like when she said that, I was like, oh, you know, I should have been, I didn't, I should have been more articulate because I didn't want people to leave with that impression. Does that make sense? The idea is that when we see systematic sins in our country and our church, we want the Holy Spirit to reveal what they are, so we can be part of the solution. Does that make sense? And yeah. didn't mean jump ship. So on a completely different topic, now I'm returning back to um, Holy Week. So we're going to cover Thursday and Friday. But so that's the triduum, is Holy Thursday, uh, Good Friday, and Easter. But I want to start by thinking of the Passion of Christ, and I know I've mentioned this, but the Passion of Christ is a wedding. The triduum is us being married. And we have a lot of... Uh, great saints who have what's called betrothal spirituality. 
And one is this Italian uh, named Catherine DeRicchi. And Catherine, at the age of 20, started to have visions which she not only could see the scenes of Christ's passion, but she could feel it. She could ha feel her hands being bound, uh, being scourged on the head. And now, here's the amazing part. These visions, they lasted from midday Thursday to Friday and repeated um, uh, every week for 12 years. I don't need visions like that. But um, the thing about it is it actually caused her to fall deeply in love, even though it's kind of a horrific mysticism. And she received the stigmata as well. Everybody only always thinks St. Francis received the stigmata. We've had a lot of saints who received the stigmata. But here's the really interesting part. The ones who receive the stigmata also have this type of mysticism of being married to God, which I think is really interesting. Um, so Catherine received the stigmata and this uh, ring around her finger uh, that she was betrothed to Christ. Now, the witnesses, the ring would look different to different people, but the odd part is uh, she, her mysticism is that, no, the, the passion of Christ is this wedding between us and Christ. And she spent her life not only as a nun, but her happiest thing was to care for others. And I mention this because there's a lot of saints who have this mysticism. But the passion, the triduum, it's one big wedding celebration. Um, so we want to be in line with all the saints. And the prophecies in the Old Testament is that when the Christ comes, the Christ, God would marry his people. And so Holy Thursday, Good Friday, uh, Easter, it's this whole wedding ceremony. So I meant this, like on Wednesday, Christ is anointed and uh, washed w with the tears of the woman, right? Well, before you get married, you have this washing and this anointing. And then on Holy Thursday, I know I mentioned this before, but Holy Thursday, what is Christ wearing at the Last Supper? Oddly enough, a wedding dress, this white robe that you'd uh, he offers a cup that's part of a wedding uh, ceremony. Uh, at the Last Supper, he's giving a speech, but he also before that says this line in John where he says, in my Father's house there are many dwelling places. Would there not, I've said that I'm coming back to take you to myself so that where I am you may also be. What's important about that is that's a wedding speech. That's a wedding speech that every groom would have memorized. Because part of the wedding ceremony is after you take the cup and the ceremony, the groom goes away. And he goes away to build onto the family compound a place for his bride. And then he'll come back in this torchlight parade with all the, the, his family and escort him to the wedding party. So there's a wedding ceremony and then heaven is a wedding celebration. Does that make sense? So... When Jesus says, in my Father's house, there are many dwelling places, that's not his original words. He's quoting part of a wedding speech. And it's apropos that it's on Holy Thursday when he's going to marry us. Does that make sense? Um, so our whole life is this wedding ceremony, growing deeper and deeper in love with Christ, and then heaven is the party. On Friday, when he's crucified, He's wearing a wedding dress. He's wearing a crown. I mentioned that when you, the day you get married at the time of Christ, you would wi uh, wear a crown. The split side, and I'll get into that in a second, um, that's a marriage ceremony. Then on Easter, he's still wearing the wedding dress. Um, day vow, evening vow. Um, okay, that was a joke. Do you, do you remember the commercial? Oh. Now, if I have to explain the joke, but if they had Russian fashion and it was the same dress over and over. Evening veil, morning veil. <laughs> you guys never saw that commercial? Okay, uh, only McMonagall. I swear to God, how are you guys going to get to heaven unless you watch <laughs> copious amounts of TV? Oh, my God. This is what I have to work with. Honest God, sometimes I feel like I'm the miracle worker. Um, <laughs> But, so I love the fact that this is called the passion. And I love that, I love it because it 
this great love affair, this passion. And every year at, at graduation, you always give hear these really, in my opinion, stupid graduation talks where some multimillionaire will say, follow your passion to the students, which I think is the worst advice you can get um, for this reason. Um, like I think this is funny. This one guy who was a zookeeper, he always loved animals, so he got a degree in biology. And then after he graduated from college, he's a biologist and he gets a job in a zoo, and guess what? He hates it. Because his passion was animals. But do you know what you get as a zookeeper? You get to pick up poo. Um, and you work in bad weather, and it's a lot of sacrifice. And he was always told that if you follow your passion, you'll be happy. He followed his passion, and he's picking up poo. Um, so, you know, psychologically, that's really bad advice to give the younger generation. The advice you want to give is not follow your passion, it's actually develop your passion. And to develop your passion, you need discipline and sacrifice and hard work. Then you get to happy. Now, positive psychologists have found this. So if you kind of think, well, I'll follow my passion, it'll just be happy upon happy upon happy. No, there comes a time where you have to pick up the poo. It doesn't matter what the job is. It's always part of it. But if you have self-discipline and this ability to sacrifice, you don't expect every day is going to be sunny. If you want to uh, have a really passionate life, develop the ability to sacrifice. Um, and so I love the fact that we do call it the passion, but the passion in Greek doesn't mean just feeling. It really means more like wrestling and pain and self-discipline. That's what Holy Thursday and Friday offer us. Does that make sense? Um, so uh, it starts with the sun kind of awful. It has this tone of sorrow. How can you not say the passion, um, the crucifixion? It has sorrow. And if Holy Thursday and Good Friday is a wedding ceremony, um, why do we prepare to receive the love of our life with such depressing things as fasting and almsgiving and sorrow for sin. Um, because, and this is going to be my point, there's a real power in sorrow. There really is. Human beings, we want to wrestle with sorrow. Did you know um, uh, just the power of sad songs and rainy days actually make us better? That there's a type of joy that's hidden in sorrow. I know that sounds strange, but C.S. Lewis explained it this way. Whereas this long poem about um, heaven, where you long for this distant land, heaven, that you've never been to. Well, you're longing for this fragrance, he said, that I've never smelt. Smelt? Smelt? Yeah, I think it's smelt. Um, it's this long poem that, what is this longing and sorrow in me, but this yearning for heaven, this oneness with God. So it's sorrow, but it's not depression. There's a difference between sorrow and depression. And why is it that people, and this is true, do you know people play their happy songs on their playlist uh, 150 times, but they play sad songs 800 times? More likely to listen to sad songs. Because the odd part is that sorrow, not depression, Sorrow prepares us for greater love. When somebody's living their life in sorrow, they're missing a love that should be there. That's not the same as depression. Um, if you're depressed, please, for the love of God, uh, get help. But sorrow is longing for a love that isn't there. That actually makes your heart deeper. Or look at literature. Um, it's homesick sickness that causes Odysseus to start the journey home. So this sorrow, um, this longing for a deeper love, it starts our journey home to the promised land of heaven. Does that make sense? Depression and sorrow are not the same thing. Unfortunately, our culture uh, is afraid of the darkness and thinks that the norm should be constant, endless days of sunshine. But sometimes the sunshine just distracts us from going deeper. 
to get to the joys of being with the beloved, and that's what Easter celebrates, then we use sorrow to wake ourselves up. So from Holy Thursday to Easter, as I said, it's one big wedding ceremony. It's a ceremony that lasts three days. Um, and it does deal with a lot of sorrow. But, um, and this is going to be my analogy, if you're going to get married, like they, we have all these marriage prep programs, right? And, I know, well, it sounds kind of like, haven't done this for years yet, kind of think, okay, if we come up with a great program, you'll be guaranteed a great wedding or marriage. Does that make sense? Oddly, the psychologist did this study. Um, there is no perfect program. Like, so we have a program, and then we have um, what's called a PMI personality profile. So a personality profile, it won't, it won't tell you whether you're crazy or not. It'll just tell the, whether your crazy matches her crazy. Um, <laughs> but here's what they found. So we do all this effort, but you know the one thing they found out uh, this is a great study, is that couple who going into a marriage can sacrifice for other people, that marriage has huge possibilities of, of surviving. If your marriage is, sure, her job is to make you feel happy, endless days of sunshine, you are in trouble. <laughs> so, yeah, we prepare, prepare this marriage with um, fasting and almsgiving. Um, uh, we try and not follow our passion. Actually, we try and deepen our passion, discipline ourselves. Um, so starting with Holy Thursday, we're just going to go through Holy Thursday. This sounds kind of strange, but uh, there's actually two Passovers. So this, if let's say we're living in Jerusalem. Let's say we're not living in Jerusalem. Let's say Jerusalem is where Boise is. And all of us, we, to celebrate Passover, you can't celebrate Passover in Coeur d'Alene. You can only celebrate Passover in Jerusalem. I, so, you, you didn't know that? Yeah, so technically there hasn't been, and I'm not being rude, there hasn't been an authentic Passover in 2,000 years. The temple was destroyed. Um, and you have to have uh, a lamb that's been uh, slaughtered by the priests in the temple. So, that's why actually in Judaism, Jews aren't allowed to celebrate the Passover with lamb uh, because it gives the impression that that is an orthodox one. So this sounds, they may do it these days, but after the temple was destroyed, after Christ died, the temple was destroyed, um, Jews were ordered never to celebrate the Passover with lambs because it'll look like it's uh, an orthodox Passover. But you have to mourn the does that make any sense? So, um, did I, I lose you on these guys? I don't know. I don't know. Well, sheep is lamb, too. Um, I don't know. I just know they're not supposed to. Um, now, they might ignore that. That actually was 2,000 years ago. But you can't celebrate Passover in Coeur d'Alene. You can only celebrate, if you look at the Bible itself, you can only celebrate it in Jerusalem. So that means all of us would have to travel to Jerusalem by foot. So, um, <laughs> well, I don't think they had planes. So the problem is, you know, it's not like everybody has pocket watches either. Is uh, They had two Passovers. So they'd have one for those who are coming in because it's not like you can bring your lamb right? Because that's a long journey. If the lamb gets damaged, no, so you had to buy your lambs there and be sacrificed in the temple. And just in case they missed it, they had two Passovers, which I think is really kind of amazing historically because some people might not make it in time. So they had two Passovers, um, one for out-of-towners and then everybody in Jerusalem. And Jesus, when he gets ready for the Passover, um, he celebrates the Passover, the Last Supper, in a secret location. So Jesus only told two of his disciples, since he knew, he knew Judas was going to betray him and the priests were out to kill him. And so he tells them, um, go to this 
house and you'll see a man carrying a water jar. Follow him and then ask the master of the house and you can, we can celebrate in the upper room. You guys remember that, right? You know what's really weird about that? Anybody know what's weird about that statement? What's that? Men don't carry water jars. So that's really weird. There's only one group of men that carried water jars. Anybody know what it is, John? Essenes. Oh, good job. Two people. Good. They carried water jars because Essenes were this like religious group that they knew the, the Messiah was coming. So they prepared night and day and they had these compounds of men. Well, if there's only men, who's going to do the work? <laughs> um, so... <laughs> Okay, you guys caught that. Um, <laughs> so the men had to do the work. And t actually, in Judaism, women carry water, not men. But So a man carrying water would have been really weird. That would have been the scene. And remember, he's, um, he's in uh, Bethsaida, not Bethsaida, um, Bethel. Um, but here's the odd part. Just the scenes also had oblates. So, like, you guys could have been a scene oblate. You're not a scene, but you're connected to that community. And uh, in, in um, where Jesus was staying, that was the scene actually took care of uh, a lot of the poor, and their oblates did. So when he says, follow the man with a water jar, that's an a scene. And if he's going to a house, that's probably a house where they had food for the poor. And... Jesus is going to the top uh, upper room above. It'd be like St. Vincent de Paul. Does that make sense? If we had a St. Vincent de Paul loaded with food, but they had a clear upper room, that's where Jesus most likely celebrated, where it was a place that cared for the poor. I just have to say, I love that. So Jesus gives these secret instructions. Follow this guy. He's carrying water. Um, and then the Passover starts. Now, I had a whole class on the ritual of the Passover, so I'll kind of skip that. But remember, when the Seder starts, uh, it starts with a question and the statement that each person, when they're celebrating the Passover, has to see themselves as coming out of Jerusalem. Uh, so Judaism and Catholicism work this way. When you're... Oh, did I say Jerusalem? I meant Egypt. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. Thank you. I meant Egypt. That when you celebrate, if you're Jewish and you celebrate the Passover meal, uh, Moses gives us instructions, and I just love this. Moses says, um, do this, you know, the lamb, put the blood on the doorpost. But then he says, now, when you celebrate, we'll be one. And then, if you're reading the Bible, Moses says, and you people, you people in the future, when you celebrate this meal, you'll be one with us. So it doesn't matter what time you celebrate the Passover. It's a timeless event. Does that make sense? So um, same with the, the last Holy Thursday. Uh, we, there's one Eucharist. Christ consecrated all. The Mass is a timeless event. And so Moses says, remember this. But when he says remember, it doesn't mean remember in the past. That You have to remember what happened thousands of years ago. He uses this Jewish word, Zechariah, that means make live in the present. So the Passover lives in the present. Jesus does, says the same thing. So the Eucharist is this wedding ceremony, but it's a timeless event. Whatever time you celebrate it, you're entering into it. And Jesus adds, just like Moses, the word must, that you must do this. It's a command. So I love that. So you have this start, and Jesus starts the ritual off, but he changes it. Now, all the disciples would have known, oh, Jesus is changing the meaning. Um, so I'll give you an example. I did this in the class, and I, I love this, but the cup symbolizes many things. And I could have a whole class on the symbol of the cup. Cups mean a lot of different things. So in the Passover meal, you have the first cup, um, and so everybody has a cup, right? So the Father says a blessing, and when you say the blessing, and uh, everybody holds up their cup, so go ahead and hold up your cup. Um, oh, 
Do you need some more? <laughs> hey, would you go get him some? Um, <laughs> she'll beat me up after mass. Uh, after class. Um, because <laughs> you're Italian. <laughs> um, you'd say the prayer, but the prayer is actually uh, from Genesis, about the gift of life. And then you drink from the cup. So the first cup is the cup of life, the gift of life. Then there's a second cup where the Exodus story is read, say this prayer. The second cup is the uh, life saved. So it's a cup of salvation. So we drink from that cup. Then there's a third cup where um, next year in Jerusalem, from the four corners of the earth, God will gather all people together. It's a cup of unity. Say a prayer and then you drink that. So you'll hear this. You'll hear the phrases, cup of life. During the mass, the priest will say, he took the cup of salvation. Cup of life, cup of salvation, uh, cup of unity. Um, but then there's also the cup of wrath, which I really kind of like too. Um, but the problem is, wrath in um, the Hebrew doesn't mean wrath in English. Like wrath in English, you kind of think anger. Yeah. Ah, is that what you mean? Yeah. Little kitty cat? Yeah. Arr, arr. Um, uh, <laughs> um, so the cup of wrath is the cup of suffering. But um, it's not anger. But going back to that wedding idea, um, if you're going to get married, you should be able to sacrifice for others. You drink from that cup, then your life is a life of self-sacrifice. Does that make sense? Um, you'll endure pain for others. So I love that. It's also the cup of wrath I'm drinking from, that I will be willing to sacrifice myself. The other image of cup, and I mentioned this, I love this one too, is um, it's a cup of love. And I know I mentioned this before, but um, in a Jewish wedding uh, at the time of Christ, you'd wear this white robe, wear a crown, and it actually starts, one of the first actions is offering um, the bride a cup, a cup of wine. So um, you say this thing, and you offer the bride a cup of wine. Knowing you, you'll probably drink it. Um, <laughs> if she drinks it, then you're in the first stage of marriage. Um, I, so it, when, cup, when Christ offers a cup at the Last Supper, it's also a wedding cup. It's a cup of love. Does that make sense? And yeah. the couple shares in it. So you have this wedding symbol, and then you have the bread. And the bread you have, um, literally it's the bread of oppression. But you'd call it the bread of the poor, the bread of slaves, the bread of affliction, the bread of humility. Um, so the unleavened bread is really what you eat when you have nothing else to eat. And so you hold up the bread. Now, I know that sounds kind of strange, but the really nice bread is the puffy bread, right? I don't, don't know what you call that. I call it puffy bread. Um, what's it? Leavened bread. Good job, McGonagall. Um, that's a nice bread, but um, I call it puffy bread. Uh, but, like, I, I was in Central America, and I was working as a missionary priest, and um, we really were just handing out packets of food and flour to the poor. And they were, not like American poor, they were dirt, dirt, dirt poor. And this one elderly woman wanted me and this other priest, um, she wanted to make us some food because we gave her uh, like flour and stuff. So we go back to her house, and like I am so naive, I really am so American. We go back to her house, except her house is not a house, it's a lean-to. It's a lean-to, and this old woman lives in it. And so we get in this little place, not much bigger than, you know, this table area, and there's a fire in the dirt, um, and that's her little, I don't know, hovel in this city. And so she starts to make, um, um, oh, I forget what you use, tortillas out of the, and she just basically cooked it on rock. And I was like, oh, 
yes, this is the bread of the poor. Because think about, if you were slaves in Egypt, um, you know, your life wouldn't have been much different than that. Does that make sense? You don't have the nice leavened bread. You have the bread of the poor. And then she shared her food with us. Like, she needed to keep that food. But um, anyhow, yeah, unleavened bread is the bread of the poor and the humble. And I love the fact that at Mass, we always use unleavened bread. Um, And then think about this. In the Passover ritual, you're supposed to remember that you were slaves that our ancestors were slaves and God freed us. It doesn't matter how successful you are, how you see yourself, how talented you are, your ancestors were slaves. With all your merit and talent and success, um, without God, you still would have been a slave in Egypt. Uh, So you're supposed to remember that so that you can have gratitude for the chance to be something more than the slave. Um, That should keep us humble. So we have to use unleavened bread to remember our origins. That unleavened bread is used by the humble. Even with all our talent and wealth and success as Americans, um, we can't earn our way into the promised land. It's only through Christ on the cross that the door has been opened. The bread of life, um, it gets us into paradise. So like the fact that we use unleavened bread we're not superior or special. We're simply fortunate. We're blessed. Um, and I love the fact that we're commanded to use unleavened bread. Um, the Passover bread, the unleavened bread, is supposed to remind us that really we're all really one step away from pain and loss. Um, I know I mentioned this, that my dad died of ALS, um, and he had a little bit of money towards the end of his life when he retired. He had a little bit of money and success, but once he was diagnosed with ALS after years, even with insurance, uh, he died dirt poor. Like, this sounds kind of strange. We are all one bad medical diagnosis away <laughs> from losing everything um, if it's extended over years. So I love the fact that the unleavened bread is uh, this reminder for us to keep humble. If you want to have this great love affair with Christ, we need to be kept humble. So I just love the symbol of the unleavened bread. And Jews have this custom of cleaning out all the yeast. And the yeast, of course, is what makes it, I think, as I said, the technical word is puffy bread. Um, But the yeast in Judaism would symbolize corruption or pride. Um, But what is humility? but somebody without an ego. And so this command to clear out the yeast is also this reminder that our our souls are supposed to be empty of pride and ego and corruption so that we can truly celebrate the wedding feast. Um, We're not supposed to be looking for the faults of others or the faults in other people's homes, uh, looking to see if they have yeast. We're to make sure our own homes, which by that I mean our souls, are free from the contagion of yeast, free from the contagion of corruption and sin. So Lent is supposed to be this good cleaning out. Um, so when you, when we celebrate, when you see the unleavened bread, think of the humility and the self-sacrifice. Uh, if we want Holy Week to be this great love affair with God, Let's practice humility. Let's take Lent serious. And then on Holy Thursday, Jesus gives this huge talk on love. In the Gospel of John, the two subjects Jesus talks the most about in the, like, huge dialogues is the Eucharist and love. So my joke is, and it's kind of true, if Jesus ever starts talking about the bread of life or love, it's a long lecture. It'll go on page and page and page. I mean, that man can talk. Um, when it comes to love or the Eucharist. So at the Last Supper, he once again gives this long speech on love. And the, the prophecy of the Messiah is that the Messiah would not only marry us, but the prophecy of the Messiah is also that he would be revealed in, on Passover. And the Messiah, being a new Moses, would give a new Passover and a new law. Moses gave the Ten Commandments. 
the Messiah will give a new law. And what's the new law that he gives at the Last Supper? Okay, somebody got that. Yeah, did you grab it? Okay, more exact. Good for you. But you know what? They don't get it. Um, no, really, even I don't think we really get it. And they don't get it. So he does this thing of the foot washing where he takes out his outer garment. Now, um, if you were the presider at uh, Passover, you'd have this festival garment. Jesus takes out his off his outer garment. Now, that symbolizes um, him shedding himself of his divinity, and he puts on a towel, the, the role of a servant, and then he washes all their feet. Now, we're so used to this, but here's the thing. In Judaism, you're never supposed to wash somebody else's feet because that's playing the sa- slave. And he even washes Judas's feet, which means he knows Judas is going to betray him, but he doesn't have any hatred. He's still a servant to Judas. And I love that idea that um, it's easy to say, oh, my law, law is love. But unless you're really willing to bend down and care for other people, even doing the absolute worst and washing their feet, then you're not really worthy of this wed- wedding. So afterwards, he puts it back on and says, now, if I, your Lord and Master, am willing to wash your feet, you must wash other people's feet. So this is a strange wedding. This is a strange wedding where the wedding is about service to other people. And I, I had two great weddings. Well, I've had more than two great weddings. But before I left Holy Apostles, my former parish, I had two great weddings. That, you know, I can be pretty cynical. You guys probably never noticed. Um, <laughs> especially about the younger generation. But... Um, so I had one wedding where he is, or I guess I'll say is, because I don't know if he is now, but he was a Marine, this Marine, and um, he, he kind of cracks me up. He's this Marine who, um, trying to date, but couldn't find anybody who really matched him. And, um, so then he starts thinking, well, maybe I should be a priest. So he goes to his priest, who's a Marine chaplain, says, I think maybe I'm meant to be a priest. And the priest says, no. No, of all people, you were not meant to be a priest. (laughs) Which I think is so funny. The guy is Italian. Like, the Marine is from this East Coast Italian family. So the priest says, you know, um, this is what I want you. I want you to go on this uh, Catholic website for dating. Just go for one month. And just do that before you talk to me about, about the priesthood. So, actually, he goes on this website, and um, it's kind of funny because the priest, I um, can't remember the whole details now, the priest was praying uh, to Padre Pio that he find uh, a love. So, oddly enough, yeah, he gets, um, uh, gets a date from this gal who lives in just another city in I can't remember. I think he was in San Diego, and she was uh, north of that somewhere. Anyhow, so he drives up to go on a date, and it's Saturday, and she tells him, she goes, oh, this, I have our date planned. This is what we're going to do, and we'll go to Mass, and then we'll go out to dinner. <laughs> and, like, I loved her, but she was a very firm person. And they just hit it off, and something happened. I can't remember exactly. Something with Padre Pio happened on their date, and then that first date, he was convinced that was the love of a life. So they did it for a year, but they immediately knew they were going to get married. So, but anyhow, um, he goes back to the chaplain and says, I had a great date and this kind of thing happened with Padre Pio. And he says, I got to tell you, I was praying to Padre Pio that you would find, and he gives, this, okay, the story's turning out longer than I wanted, but he uh, <laughs> gives him the statue of Padre Pio. So when I had their wedding, they won the statue placed in the church, too, because they believe Padre Pio. And here's the thing. Like, they, the couple that, and this is getting the foot washing, that they believe that God put them together to serve the world. That I wasn't going to be a priest. Both of them very devout. That they believe their marriage was here to make the world a better place. And I kind of love that. Then the other 
Well, now it's going to be a long story. Um, this other couple I had right after that, um, they, um, they met in Boise. There was some beer tasting thing, and you know, he, of course, was looking for somebody, and um, his friend invites him out to a beer tasting thing, and um, his mother said, you're never going to find a good woman over beer. Uh, anyhow, um, she, her friends invited her. She's really, um, her friends invited her because she was brand new to Boise. And she had gone, she's also from, I think, the East Coast. She had gone to Assisi. And Assisi, um, she goes and uh, she goes and she goes in the tomb of uh, St. Francis and she says a prayer because she was offered a job opportunity in Boise and she did not want to take it. So she says a prayer like, should I take it, should I not take it? And this sounds strange, but she says, every time God communicates to me, there's always a rainbow. And she has all these stories about, well, God wants her to do something. There's a rainbow. So her and her sister come out of the um, crypt and they come outside on a CC, you'd have to know it, and suddenly there's this huge rainbow. And her sister says to her, did you just pray to God for something? <laughs> um, well, and she says, yeah, my question was whether I should go to Boise, and there's a rainbow, and um, I guess I'm moving to Boise. So she moves to Boise, she's new, these people take her out to a beer tasting, he mets her, you know, da-da-da, end of the story, right? But here's the important part. So they hit it off immediately, but they're both very devout Catholics. And so, um, uh, anyhow, uh, before they got married, well, when they were dating, they went to adoration, praying, should they step out of the adoration chapel in Meridian? And guess what? There's a rainbow. <laughs> so um, they're getting married, but when they got married, and I thought this was touching, they said, you know, this sounds kind of strange. We really believe God put us together. We believe God put us together to make the world a better place. So um, after our vows, we want to wash uh, our godchildren's feet. So I know, isn't that neat? Like this wedding is not about us. This wedding is about fulfilling something Christ wants us to do. Does that make sense? So it's easy to talk about love, but if the Eucharist is a wedding celebration, Jesus has to really get through to the apostles. No, this is not about you feeling love. This is if you're going to share in the life of Christ, then you love like Christ, which means your life has a purpose. Does that make any sense? So I, I just tried to emphasize, um, sorry, the foot washing is part of this whole love marriage theme. So... Um, the Eucharist is out, and then afterwards, notice where they go. They go to the garden. Uh, Christ go. they go to the garden, but here's the kind of theme. Um, the garden in Scripture, every time a garden shows up, you should think of the Garden of Eden, right? But a garden is a place where lovers meet. So Jesus goes to the garden, but in the garden, Jesus is pained, not by the torture and whips that are awaiting him, He's pained because even after the Last Supper, he knows they're going to go after another love. Um, Barabbas, Caesar. So what pains Jesus is not the torture and the whips and the cross. What pains Jesus at this point is that the lover is going to desert him. And as I said, a garden is a place where lovers meet. Think about this. Adam and Eve were in the garden. Look at the Song of Songs. Where do they meet? But a garden. And Christ is alone in the garden. The apostles keep falling asleep. They're, the sleep means indifference. Um, and after the resurrection, Mary Magdalene, other women, where do they first go to look for Christ? But they find him in the garden. Um, and it's really odd that women and St. John were the only ones who were faithful to the lover who didn't abandon him at the cross. Um, but uh, so the whole ceremony is about lovers meeting. But the problem is the apostles, they're terrible. They're going to abandon him. And Christ's Passover, it doesn't end correctly, by the way. He's actually supposed to drink one more cup, but he doesn't drink it till the next day. So if you know the Passover ritual, 
you would be thinking, wait a minute, there's still one more cup to drink. He's going to drink that on Good Friday. Um, he'll say, I thirst, and they offer him wine, and then it's finished. And to contrast this theme of wedding and love of the cross, you have Judas. And I love the fact that Jesus looks so ordinary, Judas has to point him out. Um, but even after this wedding ceremony, when we're supposed to be wed to Christ, it's Judas who is a fake lover, who gives a false kiss. Um, and I love the contrast that on uh, Holy, Holy Week, on Good Friday, like I love kissing the cross, but I'm a kisser. Um, I love kissing the cross because to me it's such a juxtaposition of Judas who gives the false kiss. You know, he kisses Christ, but really he just wants to get money. We kiss the cross because, not that we want to get anything, we kiss the cross because, like Christ, we want to sacrifice our lives for others. Does that make any sense? Like, I, it's a very opposite of the gospel prosperity. Um, so the way of saying you love Jesus so you get money, that's Judas's way. We kiss the cross so that we can wash the feet of other people. We can pour out our lives. And then you get to Good Friday. In Good Friday, um, it's a day of atonement. So the day of atonement, that's in the book of Leviticus. And the, uh, the word atonement means to make one. So it's a ceremony that creates oneness. Um, and in case you didn't know what the day of atonement was, um, it's the day that the sins of the people are transferred to a goat. So they have this ritual of the Jews, it's in the Old Testament. You, you guys have heard scapegoat, right? Mm -hmm. So two goats are um, there, and the people choose one of the two goats. And the one that's chosen is the one that is going to be the scapegoat. And the priests have to put their hands on the head of the goat and transfer the sins of the people onto the goat, and then they uh, lead the goat out to die in the wilderness. So on Good Friday, you realize it's a day of atonement. It's a day of atonement. And, you know, just as there's two goats, one will be set free, one will die, that whole thing with Barabbas and Jesus, Barabbas is the other goat. Does that make sense? Um, so even the name Barabbas, I love. Barabbas means, bar means son, Abba, father. So his name is son of the father. So you have two types of saviors. Does that make sense? You have Christ, the son of the father, and then you have Barabbas, son of the father, who Barabbas' way is the way of violence. Remember, he's a murderer and a uh, killer. A lot of people want to follow God, but they want to follow the God, the Christ, that's going to kick the teeth of everybody who we dislike. Does that... Some people want a God like that, who's going to really punish. Um, we follow uh, the atoned one who takes away our sins, who suffers for us. Um, so that phrase, it's hard to explain, because somebody asked me on the way out of Mass, he said, well, when it says Jesus died for our sins, what does that mean? Well, I can explain it if you give me a half an hour. Um, but at the door of the church, I can't really explain it. But you'd have to know the whole atonement ritual. Does that make sense? Jesus is the scapegoat that takes away our sins, that you'd have to know that ceremony. When, remember, first one is that you pick one of the goats. Um, the crowd picks Barabbas. Um, one goat would be pardoned, Barabbas. But the victim, the scapegoat, after it was picked, had to be turned around to face the people. So Pontius Pilate took Jesus at a certain point and it said, set his, his face to the people and then says, behold the man. Now if you're Jewish, you would know, oh, that's part of the scapegoat ceremony. Does that make sense? He's going to take away. Then remember also that the priests have to lay in the book of Leviticus their palm on the head of the goat. Um, so when does that happen? On the day of atonement, on Yom Kippur, before the sacrifice, uh, the sins are transferred to the people by the priest putting their palms on the head of the goat. 
So I'll just read it for you. Um, Aaron shall lay both hands on the head of the live goat and confess all the iniquities of Israel. Only after that does a scapegoat take away the sins of the nations and a sacrifice of atonement is offered. So when did the priests lay their hands on the head of Christ? Well, it's recorded that the priests struck the head of Jesus, but in Greek, and remember, the Bible's written in Greek. What it literally says, it'll say, they struck him. But the exact phrase is, they struck his head with the palms of their hands. And you'd think, oh, that's the transferring of sins. This is part of the atonement, where the sins are transferred. Um, now, oddly enough, they noticed, uh, even the Jews noticed, that after an atonement ritual, the community was more united. Uh, but it always fall back into division and fighting among themselves. So what does it mean when it says Christ took away our sins? He's the scapegoat who is all our sins are laid on so that he can destroy them. Um, did I confuse anybody? Because you look totally bored, a little sleepy, more coffee. Was that too confusing? But here's the twist. I know I have a twist. In, but so, yes, I do believe Christ took away our sins. Christ is a scapegoat. But, and this is my thought, but if Christ is in me from baptism, shouldn't I be a scapegoat in some ways? And I'll give you an example of what I mean. There's this guy named Daryl Burton. And Daryl Burton was falsely accused of capital murder and sentenced to life in prison without parole. So he was imprisoned in the uh, Missouri State Penitentiary, known as the bloodiest 48 acres in the United States. And it's a very hate-filled place, and Daryl admits that he was very hate-filled. And somebody gave Daryl a Bible and challenged him to read the words of Jesus. And he found the uh, part of the Bible where Jesus says, love your enemies, pray for them, and forgive them. But Daryl hated these people that unjustly imprisoned him and took away his life. Jesus said, love your enemies and pray for them. And so Daryl joked, yeah, I prayed for him. I prayed a building would fall on him. Um, <laughs> And the third thing Jesus said was to forgive them. Well, for Daryl, he said, that was over the top. I can't forgive these people for what they've done to me. There's no way I can do that. But then later, he kept reading, reading the Bible. And he reads Good Friday, where he realizes Jesus was convicted unjustly. Jesus was sentenced to death and torture and scourging at the pillar and the crowning of thorns pushed into his skull and nailed to a cross. And he realized, wait, he was unjustly convicted just like I was. Um, and then that one verse at the end of Good Friday where uh, Daryl said this was a knife in his heart, where Christ's last words are, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. And he said that one cut his heart open because... That's the divine, not human. Only God could do that. Where, um, so he, he said Jesus had to be divine. Uh, to forgive, really, after such injustice, that is of God. So, believe it or not, Daryl began to do exactly what Jesus did and pray for the people who he hated so much and prayed for their forgiveness. And he said his anger broke. Um, he was filled with rage and hatred, and after uh, praying for them, it actually ended up broke. Uh, it, it broke his anger. And he says at one point, like when he first started, um, he said that he just couldn't forgive them. And he was praying, and he swears that he heard Jesus say, no, Daryl, you can't forgive them, but I can forgive them through you, if only you would let me. And he said that's when he started to pray for his enemies. Now, 10 years later, they actually found the real killers, and he was released. He was exonerated. But he said, I'd already been released from my prison the day I started to pray for those who persecuted me, um, and in, or unjustly sentenced me. So my point being is, just as Daryl was an innocent scapegoat, so was Jesus. Daryl used his imprisonment and, and unjust conviction 
to pray for the conversion of those who sent him there. So if Christ is in me and Christ is a scapegoat um, that accepts injustice to save others from their sins, shouldn't I be a scapegoat? Any injustice I suffer, shouldn't I be any wrong I've had? Shouldn't I pray that not that other people receive punishment for being against me, but my suffering frees them? Does that make any, did I lose, like, in some sense, I really do believe this. Uh, when we say Christ saves us from our sins, that Christ is a scapegoat, don't I want to be as well? Does that ma make any sense? Jim, did you fall asleep? Because I, um, um, okay, so just continuing the wedding theme is that the Christ, uh, sorry, the cross on Good Friday, the cross is a symbol of love. So I think this, some divers discovered this sunken tri uh, uh, ship with all these treasures, but one of the treasures they found was a gold ring of a man, and etched on the back um, of the gold band was um, two hands holding a heart, and the inside inscription uh, of the ring said, uh, I have nothing more to give you which I just love that inscription. That inscription could have been placed on the cross of Christ or the sorry, chalice. I have nothing more to give you. Jesus gave us everything he had. His body, his blood, his love, his life. He has nothing more to give us. The last act that he has on the cross is to legally, and it is a legal, adoption of his mother to us. He is stripped naked and the last very, he gave us his life, gave us his mother, to what extent do I pass on that love? When we look at a cross, think of that phrase, I have nothing more to give you. Jesus gave everything. Um, so the cross really is a symbol of love. Where Christ is saying, I will do anything for you. I will suffer the deepest pain, suffering, rejection for love of you. So think of the cross as a sign of love. And you remember what I said about Adam and Eve? Now, I might have covered this before, but I like it. When early Christians heard the story of the cross, they thought, that's the Adam and Eve story. And if you're wondering, how is that the Adam and Eve story? Let me explain it. <laughs> so you'll get tired of this, but uh, remember the Adam and Eve story? Adam has everything. And um, has everything, he's safe, but uh, he says this prayer. And the prayer is for a savior. He's lonely, and he needs a savior. And so um, God puts him to death. He'll say sleep, but it means death. And God takes a rib bone, right? But I know I mentioned this. The word rib for rib bone and one side of you is the exact same word in Hebrew. So did God take the rib bone, or did God split the atom? Well, you could interpret it either way. Um, Oh, you caught that. You're um, but the reason why we translate it rib, this is from Jews, there's this ancient saying, if God would have taken a bone from man's foot, man would try and dominate woman. If God would have taken a bone from man's head, woman would try and dominate man. But if he takes the bone closest to the heart, you'll realize you're incomplete without somebody to love. And so... Um, after that, uh, uh, he awakes, he sees Eve, the most beautiful form on the face of the earth, um, and says, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. But after that, God calls them human beings. And that's kind of key. It sounds kind of strange, but um, uh, before that, God just refers to them as earthlings. So in the Jewish mindset, and I love this, is Catholic too, that you're born an earthling, but you don't, uh, you're not a full human being until you can love to the point of death and have your side split. So Jesus is on the cross. He has this wedding garment, and his side is split. Well, if you're Jewish, you're realizing, oh, how did the human community first be, how was it first born? It was born through self-sacrifice. That's how the first Adam and Eve community, that somebody was willing to offer themselves. So from the side, what in the book of Genesis, humanity was born. 
on the cross, from the side of Christ, humanity is born. Does that make sense? Um, so I love that, that now uh, uh, the cross is this wedding symbol of our true humanity being born. The church comes from the side of Christ in the sense of, yeah, the same way the first community came by self-sacrifice, the church is born from Christ's self-sacrifice. Um, uh, there's something more about that I'm forgetting to mention. But um, anyhow, questions, objections? Yes. Mm. Hold on one sec. Let, you remember the first prayer? Sorry, I'll get to you. The first prayer of Adam was, um, okay, dancers, see you later. Could you give us a demonstration? Next week? Okay. Um, uh, oh, remember the first prayer was for a lover in the Bible, right? Adam prays for a lover. Um, I don't think that prayer is really answered until the cross. You think the prayer is answered with Eve, but it's not. It's answered with the cross. Um, that's when we truly have the love. You know, the prophecies is the Messiah would marry us, and no offense to married people, but, and this is just heart-wrenching in the Bible, so this is a little hard. Um, I was saddened when I read the story of Jacob in the Bible. The story of Jacob is such a great one, but Jacob, he's really selfish, and he steals his brother's birthright. And um, he says this weird prayer to God, God, I'll believe you exist if you get me back with my brother, beautiful wife, big lands, lots of children. Um, and God says, oh, I'll take you up on that, Jacob, because I'm a better Jacob than you are. The word Jacob means trickster. The next day, he gets near water, and he sees a beautiful woman. And he loves her. He loves Rachel. Um, and they have a great marriage. He really loves her. But you know what he really wants? He wants the love of his brother back that he never had. So even though he's happily married, um, it's not enough. He still wants the love of his brother. But in case you, I mess it up, he did marry her, but uh, her, his, her father tricked her. And he had to marry the older. He got tricked into marrying the older sister, Leah. But Leah's not beautiful. Um, and Jacob doesn't love Leah. The problem is Leah loves Jacob. And Leah, her whole life, is longing for the love of Jacob. And Jacob just doesn't love her. And she has 12 children. And she thinks every time she says, finally he'll love me. because, And her children love her. So Leah... She loves Jacob. Jacob. She longs for the love of Jacob, but she does have the love of her children. And then you have Rachel, and Rachel does have the love of Jacob, but you know what ja Leah really wants? Children. And she's barren. And it's a sad story because all three of them, they have some love in their life, but they don't have a love that completes them. Um, now, don't worry, Leah turns out fine. She discovers the love of God. But the first prayer in the Bible really is for love, uh, for a lover. But I don't think it's really answered, not with the love of family or the love of your children or the romantic love. I think it's really in the wedding of the cross that we find our ultimate love that truly fills us. So, okay, sorry. Okay, so the reason, yeah, John's gospel's timing is different than the other three gospels, but John's gospel is counting time by Roman, our way of counting time. The synoptic gospels is counting time in Jewish mindset, and the first day is the evening. So there's this whole book on it, and I can't remember the author, on how to reconcile the time differences. I totally forget all the nuances of that, but it does work out if you realize, oh, there's two different ways of counting time. Does that make sense? John has a different way of counting. Right. Christ is, right, 
Christ is being sacrificed as a lamb in the gospel. So Christ dies as the lambs in the temple are being uh, split in the gospel of John. They're having their throats split. Um, Christ dies at a different time in the other gospels. But there is there's a whole book on that, on that explaining when well, the timing does work out. But the most important part is really not the timing. The, ti- the most important part is each of the Gospels is making a symbolic truth. That, like in the Gospel of John, Jesus, ah, oh, Jesus is the Lamb of God. And I forget which one, I think, um, I think Mark is pushing more the Adam and Eve connection of the cross. So, yeah. It is. It does get a little complicated, but it's really not that complicated. Um, okay, we've got 20 minutes. Um, uh, okay, any questions about what I've gone so far? Also, just that idea, idea of um, love. Um, I want to finish up on that. Um, just because the cross, Good Friday, is a wedding ceremony, but um, so I was having dinner with some friends, two couples. Well, did I say two couples? Yeah, two couples. And I thought it was kind of funny because they have successful marriages, but during our dinner, they said, oh, if their sp- spouse died, they would not get remarried. Which I was kind of, when I first heard that, I was kind of shocked. Um, and I said, well, why? And said, because it's a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> Marriage. <laughs> and I just think that's funny because all... Those four are saying it. This is, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of sacrifice, and they wouldn't want to go through that much work again. Which, part of me found that kind of depressing. But, because um, they were saying there's just a lot of sacrifices. So then I said, but now wait a minute. Maybe those sacrifices are what kept the marriage together. Maybe those sacrifices... Um, made your love deeper rather than shallow. If you didn't have to make those sacrifices, maybe it wouldn't have been such a great marriage for you. Um, Does that make any sense? And so the same way I think marriage prepares you for the greater capacity to love for love itself, I think a lot of sacrifices um, prepares you for a deeper love. So I love the fact that we kiss the cross on Good Friday as this commitment to love through sacrifices. Maybe it's our sacrifices that keep us in love. And remember the first time, actually, I should clarify, the first time the word love is used in the Old Testament is not between a man and a woman. It's Isaac, self-sacrifice. That's the first time the actual word for love is used. Um, So for us, marriage, love, is really, like, I do love the Greek, that they have a word for love of family, love of eros, love of romantic love, um, love of friends, philia. But the greatest love of all, agape, is self-sacrificing love. So the Bible says, no, God is self-sacrificing love. Well, how the heck can I not love Good Friday when I get to kiss the cross? That my, you know... My life is supposed to be a life of self-sacrificing agape. Uh, Not the lesser loves, but the greatest. Does that make any sense? Okay, any questions before I move on to another image? Well, I I mentioned this before. I'm going to lightly touch on it, but I know I mentioned this in class because I love the tree image. Uh, That the cross, the Bible calls the cross a tree. But if you notice from the book of Genesis and all through the Bible, a tree is always where somebody makes a choice. Uh, It's always a tree. So Abraham makes a choice for God, to follow God near a tree. Adam and Eve make a choice not to follow God near a tree. Um, Moses, near a tree, decides. So there's this whole theme of... um, it's always at a tree where one makes a choice either for or against God. And um, in Genesis, when the devil comes as a snake, uh, God gives this promise that one day the snake crusher will come. The snake crusher will come and take this mortal blow from the snake, but in doing so, 
in accepting death crushes the head of Satan. Um, or it do, really doesn't matter. Um, but uh, you have all this theme that every time somebody gets near a cross, um, they make a choice. So I love also the fact that you have this theme on Good Friday that the cross is a tree and you have to choose your lover. Are you going to choose yourself or God? Um, so I know that sounds kind of strange. I, I love the fact that uh, every Mass we gather, there's, just, there's only supposed to be one cross per church in every church. Um, so sometimes, you know, you walk in churches and you see multiple crosses. You're only a, really allowed one cross. There's one cross. We gather at the Tree of Life and we make our commitment to God. But I think fundamentally, you have to make a choice for God. Um, a lot of people, they let circumstances make their choice. So I, I, let's, I, I know these two brothers, they're men, uh, grown men now, but um, they had terrible, terrible childhood. Uh, abusive, alcoholic father, and one brother also became kind of abusive and alcoholic, and the other brother became a great, I don't know how, he became this great, great person. But, um, and I know both brothers, I like them both. One, the alcoholic abusive one is in prison right now. But, uh, and I like him. I know that sounds terrible. I do like him. Uh, but he's done some stuff. Um, and uh, he said, um, he said, uh, well, he really didn't have much of a choice given who my father was. And that's why he's in prison. But the other brother, who really is a saint, great guy, uh, he said the complete opposite. I mean, why are you such a good person? He says, well, given who my father was, I didn't really have much of a choice. And I kind of thought, it's the same answer, but made a huge difference. The, uh, so I don't really believe the circumstances of your life dictate your life. I think it's a choice that you make t what to do about those circumstances. Does that make sense? So the cross is a place where each of us choose. On Good Friday, we choose, um, ah, we're going to go with gro Christ. So you can say, well, what do you worship? Um, we worship the one uh, who will, we choose to obey. The story of salvation is the story of our will. Adam and Eve didn't hate God. They just rejected God. They choose to reject his will to follow their own will. So who do you follow? Um, at the tree, you make the choice. Um, so there's a story. Take a love story. A man and a woman are dating, and they say they love each other. And they do have those feelings. But the guy never sacrifices uh, for love. And when they're having fun, it's always the fun he wants. But um, when he's uh, asked to sacrifice, he always refuses. She's the one who has to do everything. Well, is that real love? Um, or is that really, are you just worshiping your own self-centered will? Does that make any sense? And there's a guy who I really, once again, I like these guy, this guy, but he, him and his wife went to my former parish, and he got COVID. And when he got COVID, um, it wasn't that bad. But the odd part is he was one of these long haulers, and like he couldn't even make it up the stairs. So he didn't do well with a recovery. And I shouldn't say this, but and he has, they have a great marriage. But um, I asked his wife, I said, well, is he still struggling? Because it was a long hauler. And he says, yeah, he's getting a little bit better. He said, and then she says, he says, but my marriage has never been better. <laughs> and I said, why is that? And he said, well, and I don't want to use his name. I said, Bill. She says, you know, and I already knew this. She says, Bill's a little selfish. And so I said, well, what do you mean? He says, well, and this is true. I'd seen it. You know, the kids and I were driving down the street and says, oh, okay, let's go out to dinner. Where, who you, where do you guys, you, pizza? We want to go to pizza? And then it'll turn into a um, Mexican restaurant. And 
we all just agree pizza. And he says, yeah, but I f feel like Mexican food. <laughs> and he's a nice guy, but his whole life has kind of been that way. Does that make any sense? And he's, so she said, what she said is my marriage has never been any better. Is, um, she said after COVID with the long hauling, suddenly he realizes how much everybody does for him. And says he's a much better husband. It's like, are we going to go to, every, you want pizza? We're going to do pizza. Like, maybe the way of self-sacrifice is a way of real love, not circumstances. Um, that's my only point, is that um, it's too easy to say that you believe in God. Uh, the devil doesn't, oh, wait, I'm way over on my time, aren't I? Dang it, I still have 10 pages to go. Um, okay, why? Oh, sorry, I apologize. I went way, way over. Oh, what's that? No, I, no, I, 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 I promise to keep that to an hour, and I've gone ten minutes over. So anyhow, uh, sorry, I didn't get to the rest of the door. I just, sorry, I didn't. I only got a third through my notes, but hopefully it prepares you a little bit more for a holy week. Oh, don't worry. I, I'm not that brilliant. It'll come up again and again. But there's other images that I just did. Uh, good Holy Thursday and Good Friday as a wedding. It's also Holy Thursday and Good Friday is the doorway into heaven. Only one way to get into heaven, and that's through the cross. But All right, sorry. Uh, we'll have an alt, uh, another adult ed coming up, but the next one's going to be on apologetics. So we'll do that in Easter. So... Sorry I went too long. See you guys later. God bless.